all for coming. And as Mary Beth said, I forgot a couple of things and my tech did work, so I had to make this tech work. Luckily, it does. I think we're going to be able to do what I was intending to do. Um, but so to start, so my name, my name is Chris Lee. Um, Backyard ADUs is a company that I started working on in August in response to uh, basically, I, found, I was reading zoning bylaws, as one does, <laughs> and, and, it, and I found out that tiny homes are actually allowed in backyards in a lot of towns. There's just some restrictions, like they need to have a septic plan, and they need to be on a foundation. And when I, when I realized that, I, I immediately wanted to set this up because I knew that there was all kinds of reasons why someone might want to put one of these in their backyard if we could make the price work. Um, housing crisis, rising rents, um, elderly people trying to figure out if they can stay in their homes in the face of rising taxes and water sewer rates and all that kind of stuff. Um, so I started working on it. I put aside the, the multifamily development I was doing for me and figured out um, and, and made a point of figuring out how to do this for as many people as possible. And that's where I am right now. Oh, and to point out, uh, my, my friend is in the back just doing some videos so we can, he's creating some awesome new videography stuff for uh, getting the word out. And uh, Pat Smith. Hello, everybody. So. Can everybody hear, I just want to make sure people in the back can hear, because I also have a microphone available for him if you, if you can't hear. So I do. Raise your hand if you can't hear. Okay. Right. Okay. Yeah. So what I want to try to do tonight, first, what are backyard tiny homes? I think that matters because they're not tiny homes as everyone refers to tiny homes. They're a little bit different. Um, I also want to talk about Amherst rules for them so you can get an idea of how to look at your backyard and figure out if this could actually work for you. And then I want to do something more interactive in like go through how you would actually go about doing this. And I want to do that kind of answering your questions specifically, because the how you do it question stems from financing to the zoning to the, is it big enough for me? Can I continue to maintain my house? Am I gonna, like millions of questions. So we'll, we'll try to focus on the stuff that, that matters most. Um, and I'm also going to try to go through the rules in Amherst by evaluating somebody's property in real time, rather than just telling you in a list what they are. Um, and we may or may not be able to do that depending on the internet speed. So we'll play that one by you. Do we need to take notes? Um, good? You can. You can reach out to me afterwards. Um, the the worksheet that I'm going to use uh, to evaluate a property, if we can, um, is available. Um, so it's something that you could download and you could actually go out in your backyard and figure out where you could put one of these things and, and what the rules are. And I can I can send that out via email. If anybody wants paper, I can produce so, what is a backyard home? Well, it's a home in your backyard. I mean, it, it's really, <laughs> I mean, that's why I love doing this, because it's so, it, it's, I don't have to work that hard to explain it. Um, but it's, it's a backyard home. That they have, they're generally smaller than the house you live in today, but they don't have to be 150 square feet. Um, and they can look like whatever you want. Um, in New England, uh, it'd probably be nice to design something that looks kind of like a New England house. But it doesn't have to. It could be, mo it could look modern, modern-esque. Um, and it generally has some relationship to the, the main house. But again, it also doesn't have to have that. Uh, you could put up a giant hedge in front of that house and create two yards and have two completely different living situations on your single family property. Um, and to give you a, a sense of size, uh, it might be difficult, but this is roughly a 30 by 30 square. So if you think about your backyard, um, to get 575 square feet, you're looking at 25 by 20, 30 by 30, so you can kind of eyeball how big of a yard you might need. Of course, unless you want to do multiple stories. Oh. So.
So the, the other things that make up a backyard home, again, they're close, but they're not too close to the residence. So we often think of an in-law suite or a granny flat as something that's over the garage or it shares a wall. Um, but new, but rules throughout Western Mass, um, it doesn't have to be that. It can be that completely detached structure in the backyard rather than um, really uh, foregoing your privacy and having that shared wall, which is, which is tough to do right. And um, what I've heard from a lot of families who have done it that way, um, you end up living in the same living room. That, that little bit of grass tends to be just enough separation so you have to invite somebody over rather than just kind of like show up through a hallway, especially when it's cold out. They, have, they generally have separate electric, which means two different electric bills, um, but they're, they usually have shared water and sewer. And that means whether it's connected to the town or to a private well and septic. They're, they're going through the same, the same existing utilities. We have questions as we go. Yes, just jump right okay, in. So septic. Um, one of the things that happens with septic is when you increase bedrooms in your house, you immediately uh, trigger the state system to increase the size of your septic system, which could be fifteen or twenty thousand dollars right off the bat. Yep. Is that is that included? Is that the same process that would happen with this? Yeah. So with with septic, it does add potentially more cost. With newer houses, often you'll find that the septic was hopefully designed for an extra bedroom. So in that scenario, you could potentially expand this and you could add, add something over the garage or you could add something in the backyard. But if you don't, if you didn't have that planning or if it's an older home and they just built it, assume you're always going to have four bedrooms, that is going to be an added expense to the project regardless of how you build this. And you're right, it could be 15000 It could also be 30000 And generally, when you're looking at the cost of doing this, it's going to increase it by 10 to 20%. So it may or may not be a deal breaker depending on what the alternative option is and what you're planning on using it. It probably would be a deal breaker if you're trying to generate rental income and trying to pencil that out. But if it's an alternate living situation for the next 30 years, it, it, may, it may make sense. Um, and that question actually plays into the meets local building code. Uh, you've got to pass, if you are on septic, it's got to be a Title V approved septic. Um, you've got to be building these things to stretch energy code. Um, they've got to have the correct stairs for egress, unless, we can, unless they're very small and, and move into tiny home territory. Um, and that's, that's really one of the things that divides a backyard tiny home and a mobile tiny home, is the meets local building code. Might be a good idea to just explain quickly the stretch energy code. Sure, so stretch energy code. Um, I don't, know, I don't know exactly how many, but it's getting to be the majority of towns in Massachusetts have adopted stretch energy code. Um, and basically that means all new construction is being held to a higher level of energy efficiency. So in these, it means you're, you're building with two by six walls or you're using high-end spray foam insulation. So it's just a cost thing. You're putting lots of insulation in the attic um, and you're worried about, you're basically not allowed to put electric heat in anything. So it's, it's a good thing. It, it's really helping move Massachusetts closer to kind of a, a net, zero, net zero energy economy. I mean, it's going to take decades, but it's the first step. And Massachusetts has tons of incentives to help pay for that, too. So getting a little bit more. So Amherst calls these. They don't call them backyard homes or tiny homes. It's a detached supplemental apartment. So if you go into the Amherst zoning bylaw, if you're talking to Rob, the building commissioner, they're looking for its detached supplemental apartment. And a supplemental apartment would be the one that is over your garage or attached to the house. Um, and across New England, the, the names are different. You've got a detached accessory apartment. That's very common across Massachusetts and New Hampshire. And then everywhere else in the country, it's detached. It's, it's an accessory dwelling unit, an ADU. Did I understand you to say detached supplemental apartment is somehow attached to the main home? Sorry, so the detached is a, a men's it. So a supplemental apartment would be your traditional granny flat above the garage in Amherst. And the detached turns it into a standalone tiny home. Exactly, exactly. 
And Amherst may or may not change that as, as this goes. It, it, it seems to be a trend that uh, Massachusetts is getting on board with this accessory dwelling unit terminology. Um, it's just taking a little bit of time. So could you attach that to a home as like an add-on, but still have it be the little home? You could. Yeah, so you can. And that, that is a good question for uh, how to get through it's a whole other uh, zoning zoning rules and how you get approval for this. If, say, you take this and stick it in your backyard and put a breezeway between it, you automatically have a, an easier time getting this approved. It just shortens the, the approval window uh, to do that. Um, and it could be just a breezeway. And if you are putting, if you are kind of doing multi-generational living, having a breezeway may not be a bad idea. And it's not considered a multifamily, though, because the lot's not for multifamily. Right, yeah. right. Okay. Yeah, these are, these are all going in under um, new zoning rules that allow you to add this, this quasi-second unit to a single-family house. And they're allowing you, you bypass things like lot size requirements so you don't have to worry about density. Um, it's the town's way of increasing density and try to um, have like a compromise with other homeowners who don't want to live in a multifamily neighborhood saying, we're going to allow this to go through and make some exceptions, but we're going to say the homeowner always has to live in one of the two units so there's some safety on who ends up being rented to and you don't have to worry about college parties and whatever might happen next door. Um, and this is a neat one too. This is a company out of, uh, that's not one of ours. It's um, Green Fab out of Seattle, Washington does that. Um, and it's a really neat two-story design um, that I think in mass might be just shy of qualifying as a tiny home. Do you have to supply separate parking for these units? You do. Yep. Yeah, it's, um, it's the, the bylaw in Amherst, it's one unit per bedroom and a max of two per dwelling. So if you build a one bedroom, you may be able to just add one parking spot. Um, but if you build a two, you'll probably have to do the two. And if you build a three bedroom, you, you probably kind of cap out. And then there's all kinds of, that, that's, that, there's all kinds of rules in Amherst about what the parking looks like. Uh, we won't get into detail about that, but that would be kind of a, as you're going through this process, uh, that would be like a step four as you're putting together your plan is to figure out what the parking is going to look like. Does it need to be paved and a, a slew of other requirements around that. Chris, what was the square footage of the other micro um, home? Do you know? 575. I don't, oh, the one before? I, I don't know what that is. Um, my guess is it's right around 400 official square feet, um, not being the, because uh, you count out slanted roofs, so areas less than six feet tall. So I've been kind of touching on this, but what's the difference between these two? And again, it's, it's building code. It's, it, it comes down to building code. Um, this is on a foundation. Obviously, that is not. Um, this could be on a foundation if you took the wheels off and screwed it to a pad. Then you're on a foundation. Um, other common differences are this is built to RV recreational code, which is not stretch energy code. And it also doesn't, uh, it also makes, uh, there's also differences in how it's built, what the insulation is, what the electrical codes are, means of egress. Um, and this does meet all that. Now what Massachusetts recently did is they passed Tiny Home Appendix Q, which allows someone to build something closer to that mobile tiny home in their backyard and do a steeper, do a steeper staircase. Um, they do a lot, they do make some differences on egress, so you don't have to have a second full door, which is, which is enormous but you have to build it under 400 square feet. So it ends up being tight. And it raises other questions about, if I'm gonna build under 400 square feet and spend 50 to 60,000 on the foundation and the utility connections, should I build 400 or should I build 600 square feet? Which is really why you haven't seen a lot of small tiny homes start getting put into backyards. 400 uh, square feet limit that you've added the left oil or the right one? Um, the so left. these are these are probably both less than 400 square feet. Oh. Yeah, I don't I don't know the exact. My guess is this is if I were to put a number, that's probably 250, and that's probably the same. They're probably about 250, maybe less. Oh, 
Yeah, the bigger, the previous pictures, they were a lot bigger. Because you don't, you don't have to build that small. Oh, okay. Um, so if you're building in your backyard and you're going to live in it, you may want to have more, more, yeah, more the area. Yeah, the pool allow for the, is the 575 is the upper limit for the cold, building cold. Um, so the, the max in Amherst is 800 square feet, oh, unless okay. you're building to uh, ADA rules, and then you can go up to 900. Yeah, so it's pretty big. It's the size of a ranch. They're, they're, they're not small if you don't want them to be. Oh, thank you. And they actually do have a minimum. In Amherst, you can't build less, you can't do a detached less than 350 square feet. So they, they have put a limit on that. I don't know why they did that. I, I think it's it was a poison pill against this kind of thing. Um, but a, a good thing to know. <laughs> So this is so. Who are they for? I, I want to ask just the room. Why? Why are some people here? Volunteers. Downsizing. Downsizing. So you'll live in it, okay? Yes. Parent. A parent. So will they move into your under your property? In the, in the new house. Okay. Awesome. So downsizing, multifamily. Yes. And rent your house. Sell it. Sell it. Ah. Yeah. Oh. So were you thinking about staying on the property and selling the house or moving completely? Moving to moving on to my property. Oh. oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> you definitely can do that, yeah. Um, in Amherst, you can. Um, so if you wanted to sell your property and build in the backyard, um, you, you, could, you could potentially do that with... Uh, we're, we're in a condo village, so we can't do it there. Oh, okay. Are you in the Amherst co-housing? Or a no, different one? Pine Woods. Okay. Yeah, those definitely bring up a whole different set of <laughs> rules because they already have a, an exception for the density in the open space. Okay. I assume a different towns have a different rules. I love in Hadley, so they have, a, I assume that they are very, they're different. Hadley does not allow detached ADUs. Uh -huh. oh, okay. But you could connect it with a breezeway. <laughs> the breezeway is key. If you, if you build a mudroom between the two, you're good anywhere. Do you know about Springfield? Springfield does. Springfield doesn't either. Um, the first town, the first town down that way will be Agawam. Hopefully, they're in the process of updating their bylaws. Which one? Ludlow. Ludlow doesn't either. But, but every community town? allows additions on the home if it meets the zone. Right. Right? Yes, right. And they and all allow. What you're talking about it could be a breezeway or it could be something more. So yes, yes and no. Um, a lot of towns who have accessory apartment bylaws, they're more lenient to doing uh, additions that become a second unit. Mm -hmm. But not all towns allow you to add a second unit at all. Um, so they have to have this thing that says you can build a second thing that has a second kitchen and allow someone else to live there. But How about Belcher Town? Belcher Town doesn't either. So that wouldn't even be considered like an in-law place? You couldn't have that? Um, so I know Springfield and Ludlow don't allow either kind. I don't know off the top of my head if Belcher Town used, allows the attached variety. Um, I want to say they do the. Um, yeah, I, they do. They allow. It. They do. Okay. Because I how have it on the web. How do you get your town to change if they don't allow it? What do you, how do you get the town to change? Signs. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, if you, if you, uh, probably a whole another good talk, but. Okay. Um, it, it's about just approaching the the committees. I mean, if it's a town versus city. Um, depending on how the government's structured. But it's, it's getting, I mean, in Belchertown, it's probably 12 people asking their city councilor or the, the town councilor to, to change the zoning. And then it's a six to 12 month long process for them to do it with public hearings. But it does happen. Agawam's doing it right now. East Hampton's doing it right now. Uh, Northampton's going to try to do it again. Where do you find these town regulations? On the website, on the assessor's? Yes. So. The, the easiest way to find it is just to Google the town name and oh, zoning bylaw, bylaw, oh, or, zoning bylaw. or you can do the town name and accessory apartment rule. 
and okay. generally it's the first one of the first three hits and if it's not I have found it means that they don't have one uh -huh. but you should still open up the actual zoning bylaw and and scan for all of the different terminology accessory apartment accessory dwelling you can probably just call your planning department too. or you could call your planning department <laughs> <laughs> do people call anywhere anymore do you take text <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh. Oh. So I'm looking at these as potential tiny home communities mm -hmm. and not just a detached, attached dwelling unit, but a collection of small or tiny houses that are affordable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I love it. Um, we're going to be working on one with Christy. Well, I'm Christy Torres. From I'm the founder and executive director of the Western Mass Tiny Home Initiative. Mm. So, <laughs> so we're going to be partnering up um, building small communities throughout Western Massachusetts. So we are going to start tackling some of these, yeah. um, some of these zoning. And we're working on one in Springfield, and we're going to be applying for a CPA grant to try to build it and add uh, 15 of these for homeless veterans. Yeah. Uh, Amherst would be a great spot for it as well. Um, we're, we're also working one in Chesterfield with a landowner who's got 60 acres who wants to, to develop something that is quasi affordable. Um, so it's huge. They're, these small houses, in my opinion, why I started working on it, I can't see myself living in an apartment building. Um, I don't like sharing the walls. I don't like going through a hallway to get to your front door. Um, I'd always prefer something like this. Um, and you can do it. It, it kind of fits into the co-housing zoning bylaws in yes. some ways with some exceptions mm -hmm. um, and as it as it hasn't been done in a big way there's going to be lots of questions to how it ends up happening um, I the big the big new affordable housing development that's on question I think in South Amherst I wish they were doing this <laughs> but um, so we talked about this one multi-generational this is 80 percent of all uh, of these homes being built in the US including the West Coast where they're about 10 years ahead um, heard a few people in here who want to do, who wants to downsize, and then the whole other piece is what do you do with, uh, with the primary house? Sell it, rent it, there, there's a few different options around that, and we'll, I'll try to touch on that at, towards the end. Well, I was going to ask a question related to the selling the primary yeah, we can, unit, and the legalities about that in terms of the dwelling, does it separate from the sale of the property? It does. There's a few different ways to do it. And I'll, we'll, we'll, we'll touch into them on like the how-to. And there's a lot of, that's one area where there's not a full and full way of doing it. The, the zoning bylaws do not specify how to do it. Um, and some towns explicitly ban some of the, the strategies. Amherst luckily doesn't right now. But if 10 people do it, they may think differently. Um, but we'll, we'll talk about that because there's a few neat ways. Um, I do want to touch on this one. This is a, a really interesting opportunity for these. And, and this kind of uh, came forward. Our first two projects, the first one is for, uh, it's a long-term plan for a son with autism who's not going to be able to live on his own potentially. And the second one is for an adult son with Down syndrome who's going to be living in the backyard. Um, and I met, I met a guy who is in his 50s in Florence the, like three weeks ago who has cerebral palsy. And he was telling me how he wanted to have his own house but couldn't do the whole thing on his own. And Massachusetts gives $50,000 to a homeowner or landlord uh, in 0% interest to help do this. So if someone has a backyard and wants to create housing for someone with a disability, Massachusetts is going to give you $50,000 at 0% to make it happen. And then you can work out a fair rent with that person who's going to live in your backyard. So I'm dying for more people to do that. And we've been talking to Pathlight to try to figure it out. But Is there any, uh, do you know what happens if this person moves out? Are you then required to continue to build the space with someone with a disability? So if, you, if they move out and you don't. I mean, if you can't find one, then what happens? So I, they don't have a lot of uh, examples of that happening because it hasn't been used that way. It's usually within family. Um, but the example that's set for like the affordable housing trust, if you take affordable housing money, it gets prorated and you have to pay some of it back if you don't continue to honor it. But there are so many people with disabilities that need housing, there's always going to be someone that will want to come in and, and live there, especially because it's going to be new, it'll be accessible, it'll be theirs. 
they won't have to go. Uh, the guy Chris's biggest gripe was he hated going in the elevator mm -hmm. to get to his house rather than just go in the front door. And that 50,000 too does apply to uh, if you're starting to have mobility challenges, start trying to age in place. And it's a little bit gray on whether or not it could apply if you're planning to have a mobility challenge in the next 10 to 15 years. Um, <laughs> well, I, I, diseases where you know that's going to happen. Diseases, old age, old age getting you old. Laugh at really, but, yeah, I mean, a good portion of seniors can't go up the stairs at some point. Um, and I, and I, I think, I don't know, the program may or may not apply for that, but it's something that if, if, it, if it could be something to bring up with that group. And the way that programs like that get adjusted is by people asking to have them adjusted. And I think it's in the spirit of the program to help people age in place. Um, I think what, when it started, the program didn't quite realize that once somebody has a big mobility challenge and can't get up the stairs, they're probably also not going to be building a whole new home in their backyard. So by bringing that forward, it could create the opportunity for a lot of people in their 60s to not get into that situation in the first place um, and start thinking about like a, a home health aid and, and things like that. Excuse me, what's the name of that? Uh, the Home Modification Loan Program, HMLP. Um, and Wayfinders administers it in this area. Okay, and we kind of started touching on this. We'll talk more about it, but the opportunity to kind of split your property up without actually doing a formal multifamily split. Um, it's a little bit more complicated. Uh, Habitat for Humanity has done this in Northampton uh, to create more affordable units, and Northampton is generally for it. It hasn't been done in Amherst, to my knowledge, so that it could be different, but we will talk more through that. Okay, so what are the zoning rules? So we, we start touching on this for detached, the detached variety has to be between 350 and 800 square feet. Um, if you make it fully ADA compliant, they're gonna create a, they're gonna allow you to go up to 900 square feet. Um, and generally, if you make it ADA compliant, you're, you're gonna be up there anyway because of the size of the bathroom and creating bigger hallways and it, it's easier to design if you're bigger. We touched on parking, one spot for a one bedroom, uh, two spot for a two plus bedroom. Uh, I did infer this from the way the bylaw is written. It doesn't specifically say how many parking spots you need for an EDU. It does say how many parking spots you need for accessory uses, and it's one per bedroom for lodging. And it is uh, two per dwelling unit. Um, and I had a conversation with, with Rob back in August when I first when I first started working on this, and he suggested that parking might be a great spot to ask for less parking, uh, depending on the neighborhood. So there's a little bit of gray area there. Owner-occupied, you have to live in one unit. Either it's the small one or the big one. What about setbacks? Are they the same setbacks as they are for the main house or the tiny house? Um, so if in so if you're in the and I'll, I'll show you this in well, on the screen. There are different districts in Amherst. Yeah. So the they're they're the same if you're in the f if you're in a side yard as the primary residence. Um, they and then if then there's a exception if you go into the rear yard, you can do it equal. The setback can be equal to its height. Equal to what? To its height. You said that like a shirt. What does that mean in English? So I, I'll, I'll show it. I, I'll show it. it. It's more, it's better to see it visually because it, Amherst, let's have a, a, a weird one where it's kind of crossing the, the two different sets of setbacks because it's not clear if it's an accessory structure or part of the primary dwelling. And that, that's kind of common around towns. It happened in East Hampton as well where it's a little bit gray. But when you see it, it will make more sense. Um, so this question comes up a lot, lot sizes. There isn't a minimum lot size specifically, but due to setbacks, um, due to things like building coverage ratios, how much land can all of your structures cover, it creates a, a quasi lot size. Like if you have a very small lot, you may not be able to put it in a spot you want to and still get the setbacks that you need. 
Well, like, I have an old barn, and so in Amherst, could I put a tiny house if, the, if I remove the old barn? And would it have to be on the footprint of that building, or uh, could it be anywhere on the lot? Good question. So it depends where the barn is and if it's conforming, meaning if it's inside of the required setback or beyond. Um, and then it, you're going to run into, and I, I don't know this specifically for Amherst, what the rules are for getting a change of use on a non-conforming structure. I know in some towns they don't allow you to do a change of use if it's non-conforming. So they'd allow you to renovate and repair the barn and continue to use it as a barn, but they wouldn't allow you to renovate and repair it and then also turn it into a unit. Well, I'd be but repairing I repairing it. Why not? I think they do. They well, do? Yeah. I'm not 100% sure. <laughs> okay, I have to confirm. I, I know East Hampton does not, uh, and it kind of gets a little weird when you're getting the change of use question. Yeah. Why okay, can't you, you can't. That? Don't, don't. Okay, that's it. Don't, so, don't use my name. Okay. <laughs> why, why can't a barn be turned into a living unit? It, it depends if it's conforming or non conforming. Which Some means? towns don't allow you to. So if, it's, if, it, if the setback is now 15 feet uh -huh. and the barn is 5 feet from the property line, you could renovate it as a barn, but there may be a restriction on whether or not you can convert it to a living unit. Um, but I can check on that. If, if, if you yeah. send me an email, I'll, I'll confirm one way or the other. Can you only do one additional house on your property? So you can only do one additional thing qualified as a supplemental apartment. But if you have more land, you can do more as a multifamily property. So if you have a bigger lot, it could be classified as a four family. If you have a huge lot, you could look into dividing it up and creating multiple four families. So that gets kind of in more into the real estate development wing, which is what we're working on with the, home, with the landowner in Chesterfield. We're not creating nine ADUs. We're creating a micro cottage community. It's what we're doing in Springfield as well. Um, and hopefully going to be doing one in Florence. But it's a great way to make land more affordable if you build several and resell them or rent them, whatever you have capital for. It, it makes a huge difference. But if you, even if you have a big lot, you are not allowed to just build a more unit on that, right? It needs a lot, a lot of paperwork. And with, Lots of paperwork. With the, with the town approval of the vote or something. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. So the way you would go about doing a bigger project is getting to know exactly what the rules are that are associated with, I mean, the, it's, it's far too detailed to go into right now, but there's, there's a few different paths you take, uh -huh. and you're just following, you're not following the ADU rules. Uh -huh. Maybe you, uh, maybe you are, maybe you aren't, depending on what you build. Uh -huh. uh, it just gets... I mean, this is how when someone's planning a big real estate development project, they've read the bylaw, they know it hopefully as well as the people who they're going to be talking in front of, and then it's a back and forth with the community um, to make something that everyone is happy with. So that's what, that's what it becomes. Um, final one, no short-term rentals in Amherst, so you can't build one of these and do Airbnb. Okay, so... There are, there are more rules. I was well, going to... Short-term rentals is how... What's the time frame for a short-term rental? It doesn't specify. Uh, it, 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 what the bylaw does is it refers to another section of the zoning bylaw, um, accessory lodging. So it, it talks about bed and breakfast, and it talks about uh, hotel-type situations off of a residential home. Um, but it doesn't... I, does it give like a month? I, yeah, I, I, it doesn't give a specific time frame, but if it looks like short-term rentals, it's there. It, it, they'll see it, and it comes down to enforcement and in a tough situation. Do you have this on your website somewhere? Um, the basic rules for Amherst are on the website. Um, I keep going back and forth outside of ADU rules to zoning rules in general, so it, there's a there's kind of a spot where we transition to the more complicated. Um, but it just depends on if you if you want to build more than one, it's more complicated, and we should talk more because <laughs> it's just going to be very dependent on your lot, what zone you're in, and what we're going to try to do. And there's a 10-page DIY guide to take you through the ADU stuff, which what I'm going to use. I'm going to try to use. Um, I'm going to try to do this, but.
All right, so I don't think I'm going to be able to look at somebody's property. Let me. Okay, so where's my. All right, so this, this guide is available on our website. And it takes you through the process of evaluating your backyard. I use it to evaluate people's properties. I, I basically put it together because I couldn't keep all the towns straight as I'm going through and figuring out what somebody can do. Um, so it should work. We haven't gone through the approval process in Amherst yet, so there might be some inconsistencies. Uh, it comes out when, whenever you do a, a, anything where you're going in front of the ZBA. You find stuff out as you go through the process. The planning board, the, the planning department is extremely helpful in that, um, but it, it's it, it's probably ninety nine percent. So let me see if I can open this. Cannot connect to it. Let's... Oh, trust manager. I do want to go to that. This is where everyone's personal information is for everyone to look at. <laughs> Has anyone looked at this before? Property records and all of the info? Yes. Sure. Um, so it is loading. Does anyone want to volunteer an address? Yeah. Hmm? Yeah. Okay, what? We'll start. 471 Station Road. 471 Station Road, okay. Stagecoach. Station. 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 Sorry. My cousin lives on Stagecoach. Four, seven, one. Four, seven. Okay. Um, bring me there. All right. What a wonderful property for an ADU. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so. Um, I'm going to try to go back and forth. We'll see if this will allow us to do that. Maybe I can. Let's try to do this. OK, so we'll try to do this a little bit. All right, so we kind of we talked about this. Is first one's easy is your property single family residence. If it's not, you can't build an ADU. Um, the, the towns are trying to keep these as conversions of single families, not adding a third unit to a two family or a fourth unit to a three family. Um, and that's pretty common everywhere. There's a few towns that allow them to be added to a, a two unit, but very few. If you do have a two family property, you go down the path of real estate development where you're looking at the dimensional requirements for your, for your lot, trying to figure out do you have enough land to, uh, to add the other unit, do you have enough frontage? Lots of different questions that come up. And it may be that you could add an ADU or you could add a second unit. And that raises a really interesting set of questions about what are your goals? Um, because if you add a second unit, it's gonna increase your property value more than if you add an ADU. So if the goal is to build it and you're selling in the next five years, well, maybe you add a second unit. So the next part about this, um, I'm not going to go through and calculate this piece because it, it, it's very uncommon that it would mean you can't build. Um, but there's a concept called the open space ratio. And this is just looking at there has to be a certain amount of grass and greenery on your property. You can't build up the whole thing. And every district has a different ratio. 
um, the more dense districts, you can build more stuff on your land. Um, and to calculate this, I'll show you what you're what you're looking at doing is taking your total your total land um, and looking at what the footprint of all your accessory structures are. So you you. You multiply the, the size of the floor of your house. If you have a big garage, if you have a um, if you have a shed in the backyard, you take that all you add all of that up and divide it into your acreage, and figure out how much open space you have. And you need to stay underneath. Uh, you need to stay in, in guidance with these with these ratios. And looking at. Your pro what was your name? What? What was your name? My last name. Yeah. Metropolis. Metropolis, okay. Almost no chance that you're going to have an issue with open space with that, with uh, 0.84 acres, unless you already have an enormous amount of structures. It will be very difficult to. Nothing but a small 1,700. Okay. Foot. Yeah, so you, you definitely do not have to worry about this. In okay, yes. Okay. Yeah, you, you won't have any issues with, with these ratios. How does, how does having wetland on your property impact your open space requirements? Um, so it doesn't. So it, it, if you're in a conservation district, you're going to have a higher open space rate, a higher open space ratio. Or I'm, I'm, I'm mixing my term out. Amherst calls it building coverage. Um, it's going to be more stringent. It's not going to have a different impact. But when you go into conservation land or wetlands, all of the typical things with building any structure in there apply. So you have more worry about when you're doing the actual construction with runoff, the, the post-construction, you have to worry about a, a slew of different things. It just makes the construction more expensive. You may have to do additional things to save to conserve the area. Kind of like the septic question. It, it may add cost. Um, and we're doing that. I haven't, I haven't done that in Amherst yet, but wet, the watershed protection di district in uh, Northampton does add cost to, to construction. OK. All right, so we touched on what you can build. Amherst is lucky that there's no, uh, it's just a straight 350 or 800. Uh, often you see it has to be in proportion to your existing house. Luckily, we don't have to worry about that here. So if you had a 1,700 square foot house in East Hampton, for example, you may be only allowed to build 600, 600 square feet because of, um, by the comparison. OK. If, if the primary dwelling has town sewer and water, can you just connect to town sewer and water, or do you have to put in a septic system? No, that's, that's exactly how you do it. If you, okay. if you are on city water sewer, you connect directly to it. OK. Yeah. Thank you. If you have septic? Um, you hope that your septic's big enough for an extra bedroom. <laughs> if not, it's, a, it's just more, it, it's an extra expense. Um, and there should be records of what the septic design is somewhere. Um, if not, um, we've got to bring an expert over and get it all Title V reviewed and have that done before construction starts. Um, so these are height requirements. Generally, you're not going to run into this. These are, these are very tall. Um, a single story, regular pitched um, house is 15 feet tall. If you go to the, I mean, if you if you start doing like a, a a steep steep roof, a 12 over 12, you may get closer to 19, um, but you're not going to get anywhere near the 35 or 40. If you start going two and a half stories, that's when you're gonna that's when you're gonna worry about that. Okay. This section is talking more about open space ratios. If you are up against that, you have to figure out how big of a structure you can build. Um, and if you are up against it, it creates questions. Should you go two stories and have a smaller footprint? 
to kind of to, to work through it. Um, and this does have a, a guide as to how you'd go about calculating the the square foot and the coverage of the of the things in your property going right through. I, I imagine calculating area isn't too bad, but does a does a hard um, driveway change that like a pattern or some concrete driveway change that change that? I'm gonna to have to double check. Did I let me let me see if I wrote that in here. That's one of those specific questions I would double check in while reviewing a property. Again, it differs town by town. Um, Same. Yeah. So I did. Amherst allows also limits the amount of non-pervious surfaces. So. Um, but this is a different ratio. It, they're, they're putting that under the lot coverage. So there's a total ratio for buildings. There's a total ratio for all non-pervious. Thank God I put that in there. <laughs> this is why I have the guides, because there's two. There's, there's a lot of different rules. OK. All right, so where can you build? So now we're going to go back to this chart. Um, so I, I started talking about this. So we're following primary resident setbacks for sure if you're in the side yard. So if you're in the side yard in view of the street, you have to make it look kind of like your house. You're going to have more stringent review during the zoning board process. And you're following the same setback requirements of your primary residence. Now, if we come into the backyard, um, it's, there's an opportunity to go closer based on the height. And that's because this is technically, it's an accessory structure. So if we're putting it in the backyard, now we're following the accessory structure rules. And in Amherst, accessory structures can be as close to the side of the property as they are tall. In practice, you may run into, like if you're in the RO, out one of these larger setback areas, you may have benefit of uh, building at 15 feet, which is the general height that you'll probably be at. If you're in the, the more dense areas where you're at 15 or 20 feet, it's difficult to build something that looks nice under 15 feet tall. Uh, you end up doing a flat, low pitch roof. It ends up looking like a mobile home. It, it just ends up being not something you're, you're going to want to build. Um, yeah, just if you go, if you go, one, to build under 14, 15 feet tall, it gets difficult to design it so it looks nice. Um, you, especially if you're trying to create vaulted, you end up needing to use vaulted ceilings, uh, a flat roof, something with a very shallow pitch. So it doesn't, it doesn't generally fit in with the neighborhood very well. Um, you can do it. You, you absolutely can. Um, a lot of prefab stuff that's happening out west is being designed to ship down the highway. Um, <laughs> mobile homes are designed to ship down the highway with the, with the shallow pitch roof. Um, the stuff they're doing now has a single pitch. Um, I have a photo of it here. Like, uh, so this in the middle is an example of something, I believe that's 12 feet tall at the peak right here. So that, that would work. And that would allow you to kind of go underneath that 15-foot uh, guideline. But in Amherst, something like this is probably not going to be allowed in your front yard, because it does say it has to match the character of the neighborhood. And it does reduce costs if you do prefab as well. If you're, doing, if you're partnering with a, a factory to help build these, um, it does reduce costs to be able to ship it in one piece or um, without needing to do cathedral ceilings and whatnot. So for these setbacks, so I'll show, let's, well, we'll take a look at, um, so back on here, so right here we're looking at what, uh, this is the, the zoning district, um, RO, and if you click on this, it's going to open, uh, Amherst actually has the best interface for looking up your properties of all of the towns I've looked at. Um, nobody, no town actually tells you the zone right out of the gate. Nobody gives you a link to the appropriate. It's very good. Um, so 
when you're using it, just feel happy you live here. Um, so anyway, RO, we're going to come back over here. We're going to look for RO. RO, outlying residence. We need to be 25 feet from the street. And we need to be 25 feet from the side and the rear. So if we come here and we look at this property, let's zoom in, and we can see the generally where the driveway is, where the main house is. If I come up here, I can um, I can start doing some back of the envelope measurements. So I can see we are 54 feet to the corner there. So something could be built in that corner. Um, something could also let's see if I can um, So if we look at the front one, something could also be built up here. Is that telling me the you hit areas? How did I draw a measured length? So if we look up here, a really nice spot for an ADU on this property to use existing infrastructure would be somewhere right in here. You could, you could have it right off the main driveway. You don't have to build lots of new paths. You don't have to build more parking. Um, your, your sewer water is, is coming somewhere. You said you're on septic, didn't you? Yeah. Ah, OK. It's somewhere over here. Yeah. So assuming your septic is the right size, if you were to build something over here, you've got a straight shot to connect to it without having to go into your basement. So let's so what you can also do with these is take a look. Oh, yeah. So you'd have to cut some trees down and put it over there. <laughs> Um, so actually, this where your septic is is, a, is also a great spot. You would just have to build a longer path. And if you're if you're building closer to the septic, um, that's a much deeper, more expensive trench to build than than a lot of the other ones. You're going down four feet deep at least, and you're trying to get the right slope. So you you end up having a very deep, long trench to do it. But if you can build close to where the septic is without getting on top of or disturbing the leach field, um, it, it can reduce costs and allow you to build a really nice Goshen stone path or something to get out to it with the savings. Does town sewer exist on Station Road? On they just uh, did it just before a year and a half ago. I put the new oh. septic set, but they were. They just finished. So it might be the time to hitch up. Well, there you go. So maybe you don't have to worry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully, if it's new, hopefully they planned it for an extra bedroom. Mm -hmm. I don't know. So these ADUs, you build a flat, you're not allowed to have a basement? You can have a basement. You can't. Okay. Yep. That's optional. Okay. Yeah, yeah you can, you can build that. Um, so it's a good question. I, I don't think it would be. No. Uh, they're generally right. Um, generally, what they're trying to do with the square feet is not to build a gigantic structure. Um, so the basement would generally be able to do it, and they are looking at uh, uh, the livable, like the the gross living area. And um, when they actually they don't calculate it for the house here, but yeah, you'd be able to do it. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, it depends if it's a walkout basement and it's got living. It depends in the ten different towns. Okay. Yeah, it's always excluded from the appraisal square feet, um, because Amherst isn't even looking at the square feet of the existing house. I, it's not. It's not going to be an issue. In East Hampton and Montague and Chesterfield, they all do this thing where they're looking at the square feet of the house and they go between gross living area, actual living area, and they apply it differently. But the best, the good news is most towns are very pro accessory dwelling units if they have the bylaw. So the zoning board is interpreting the bylaw in your favor in a lot of ways. 
because they're pro housing. They realize this has to get done. They realize this is better than a giant apartment building going in a, where trees currently are. Do your neighbors have any negative, possible negative input? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I they yes. Um, they, they, yes. So if you do a detached one, you have to go in front of the Zoning Board of Appeals. Uh, it is a public hearing. Uh, it can be negative. Um, what, what you want to do to avoid that is include direct neighbors, any stakeholder in your project, in your planning process. As soon as you think about this, bring them into it, explain what you're doing, why you're doing it, ask them if they want a hedge. If they want a hedge, give them a hedge to, to block the view. Um, the key is not to have that conversation at the Zoning Board of Appeals because it will get ugly. Uh, it will become a town meeting. It will not, like, they'll just be, just hate. And we, we experienced that with our first one in East Hampton. We, we did not follow, we did not um, properly bring the neighbors in early enough. Um, you do not want neighbors to learn about your project with a notice in the mail or a legal ad in the Gazette. Um, but they can't shut the project down because they don't want it. They have to do the same thing you're doing in creating your plan, and they have to find a zoning reason that it can't happen. And if you have a good plan, there's, it's going to be very difficult for them to do that. The biggest area that they can fight, so if you wanted to put one right up here on the road or, or close in this guy's view, they're going to argue against it fitting the character of the neighborhood because that's ambiguous. What is the character of the neighborhood? I mean, is it hardy board siding? Is it, is it a 12-12 roof? It's the status quo. It's a status quo, and that's, it's not written in the bylaw, so it's up to interpretation. Um, and I, I believe it's, in some ways, it's a good thing, because it allows neighbors to have conversations about this. Um, and assuming that you shake hands with your neighbors and sit down with them, you'll come out with a good outcome. OK. The people who live in the what? house, do they have to be related to you? No, not, 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 not in Amherst. So we're at 7.30. What time do we have to wrap? You go as, as long as you As long as, as, long as they're, okay. okay. I don't think they want to stay that long, but. <laughs> so we can do, I, I can, we can look at more properties, or we can kind of talk about the execution, financing, and all, financing the condoization stuff. We have to play it going. Okay. So. So let's see how I want to do this. Could I understand you to say that the, the, the value of your property, the assessed value of your property for tax purposes will not change after this building is built? No, it, it will change. Okay. Um, you're going to, you're basically adding square feet. You're adding a bathroom, you're adding a bedroom. Um, what What is, more ambiguous, more gray, is will it change like adding a second unit? Um, if you are appraising the property as an appraiser for a bank, the answer is it won't change as much as adding a second unit because it isn't one. Um, it's this weird half, air, half thing. And as you can see, two units appraised for enormous amounts of money in towns where rents are high. Um, so adding an ADU, it's this weird middle ground where it's kind of up to the tax assessor on how they're going to consider it. Because the tax assessment is not necessarily correlated with the bank's appraiser's assessment. Um, and we're, we're going through this right now uh, in, in Northampton, where we our project in Florence, it could be a two unit or it could be an ADU. Um, so I'm having a conversation with the assessor this week to get a better understanding of how he's going to assess the property once it's built. Um, if he's just going to assess it as a second unit, well, we're just going to build a second unit. But if it's still going to be a single family residence, we're going to keep it like that so their tax bill doesn't go up too much. But then when you go to resell it, you, you want to think about it differently again. And you can do a conversion later on. Okay. So 
So it's going to try to do this on here, um, but we've kind of talked about everything. So let's start with, well, how many people in here are uh, looking to create something in their backyard for a parent or family? OK. And how many are looking to do it for themselves, moving to the backyard? OK. So we're about half and half. Is there anything else? Rental units? Yeah, rental. Yeah. Rental unit, rental unit. OK. Um, I don't know how, how useful it will be to write on here. So I'm going to write this out. Condoization. And this is, we're going to start with, we're going to start with um, if you're doing this to downsize and stay on your property. So if you're downsizing, let's do it this way. So downsizing. All right, so if we're downsizing, we can, we can do a condoization. This option is potentially a good one if you have no interest in being a landlord. Um, it's not necessarily going to be the, the best financial decision um, because there's not a lot of comps on what happens when you condo as a single family property. So what this specifically is, um, and it took me 15 minutes talking to uh, Megan, who's at Pioneer Valley Habitat for Humanity, to understand what she meant. And it's actually not that complicated. You basically take the larger house, house. and the smaller house, and you turn them into condos. So you essentially have a two unit condo association. Your old big house is a condo. This new house in your backyard is a condo. And together, you figure out how you want to mow the lawn. And what that does is, once you condoize it, you have two separate assets that people know how to buy and sell. Um, what you don't know is what happens to the value of your original house. Because there is a value of a single family home as a single family home. Uh, there's not a whole lot of uh, ideas and comparable sales that tell you how much is a single family home worth with a condo in the backyard. So that's a question mark, and I don't have a good answer to it. Um, my guess, my guess is from where rental markets are and where valuations are, the closer you are to walkable city center, the less of an impact condoization is going to have on the value of your home. Because uh, generally, as people get more dense, they, they don't need as much space. But if someone's moving out into South Amherst or away from the city center, they're not going to want to share their property as a two unit. So that's one of them. Um, it, it costs between six dollars and $15,000 to drop the condo documents. And that's something that uh, you generally work into. How much are you going to sell it for to make sure that you, you make that work? Um, and also thinking about the sale before you do anything. Like find somebody, list, list this idea um, on the MLS, find a buyer contingent on it becoming a condo, and then do it, rather than go through this whole process and hope you have a buyer at the other end. Um, renting. Given where rental markets are for single family homes in Amherst, this is probably the best financial decision. Um, I was looking at how much single family homes are renting for in Amherst right now. I didn't see anything less than $2,200 a month. And I saw stuff as high as $3,600 a month. So if you do a quick back of the envelope over the course of the year, you're going to be taking $30,000 in rent, maybe $50,000 in rent. That's going to completely pay for all of the taxes on the property. That's probably going to pay for a lot of your mortgage on building this new home in the backyard. Um, it's going to pay for lawn maintenance. And it's probably going to pay for um, paying, putting money away to fix the roof in 20 years. Um, it, the catch is, of course, you might have to worry about the roof leaking. But that comes into, as you're thinking about doing this, and building the backyard home. Part of the backyard home project 
is doing a detailed evaluation of your home and identifying things that are going to go wrong in the next 10 years and potentially fixing them now. Or at least saying, in year five, I'm going to need to replace the boiler. Or I'm going to need to replace the roof. Or if you know your plumbing has a tendency of getting clogged, fix it now so you don't get a tenant call at 9 o'clock. Um, I to put an asterisk over that tenant call, if you don't want that call, you can hire a manager and have them take the call. Um, but with a single family home, if you've been living in it, if there's not a whole lot that goes wrong, it's probably not going to change that much when you have a nice family move in this, um, into, into the house. It's not just going to start breaking um, unless, of course, you get a really bad tenant. But luckily, if you're renting out a single family home and you live on premises, you can be more picky with who you pick. Um, you can take your time and really find someone that you think will be friendly, someone that you want to live close to, without worrying about going to court over, over a lawsuit. Um, and that only applies if you're living there. And it does not give you free reign to discriminate. Um, but it does allow you to really find someone that you'd feel comfortable walking by when you get home and stuff like that, or seeing playing out in your backyard. Condoization, renting. Um, these are the two big ones um, for downsizing. So can I, you said there was a, a fee for condo documents. What's the fee for rent, a rental, dropping the rental documents to build that? Um, depends how you do it. LegalZoom is 100 bucks. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's not much. I mean, if you want to bring an attorney in, there'll be more fees, but I... Um, if you're just renting a single family home, there, there's lots of uh, leases that you can get. So it's just a matter of getting a lease. It's not yeah. Okay. If you want nothing to do with renting your home, um, you get it's a 10% property management fee, so that's mm -hmm. off the top, but it's not huge. And then you may have to pay a fee if you want someone to find a tenant too. And average is a hundred dollar yearly um, permit fee for renting. Okay, on top of it, and you do have to submit a management plan with that too. So you actually have to give the building commissioner your plan on how you're going to pick a tenant and how you're going to take care of things and parking. And, parking. and just to continue that thought, in order to do this, do you have to actually live in one of the properties on the property that you own? Yes. Yep. Um, if you're talking about more than, if you're not talking about ADUs, if you want to build multiple of these under multifamily rules, you don't have to live there. So that's a, that's a different thing. Um, if you convert it to a two unit and did this, you don't have to live there. And that just comes down to is your lot big enough to do it. Um, one other thing that is possible with this condoization, if you don't have the cash and don't want to take out a home equity line to build in your backyard, um, you could potentially list your house for sale, get a purchase and sale agreement contingent on building, and using uh, the proceeds from that um, to build this backyard. So you can, you can line it up so you're reducing the risk of building this thing and trying to find a buyer. You can kind of line the whole thing up before it all happens. But it gets, that's when you start getting into your sales strategy and, and the condoization strategy, which is a... Okay. I got a question mulling around. Okay. If, in the condo situation, if the original homeowner dies, what happens? And, the, and you've made a condo, so the other, the people living in the tiny house, presumably, or living in the main house, but whatever, it, it becomes more complicated. Do you have any answers? Is that a lawyer's Good answer? question. Um, so the second person, Amherst, who, who asked that question, which well, is good. Some I of us are getting old here in Amherst. Well, it, it, it hasn't come up in Northampton or, or, or East Hampton or any other town yet, but it has come up here. Um, so here's what I said to the other person. It's, it's an absolute gray area because it hasn't happened. When the zoning bylaw was written, they didn't think about that. Um, what I think would happen is the, as long as you, the, you have a will in place and the chain of ownership goes down to the kids, 
I would have to say there's going to be a grace period to figure out a plan for that house. It's not going to be able to get rented indefinitely because that would be breaking the zoning rule. Um, but I also don't think that the, the building commissioner or the police are going to knock on the door and, and say you have to tear this down. Um, I think there'll be a, a, a period, I don't know how long it would be, it could be a year, it could be two years, uh, to figure out the ownership of that. But, but the children would not just be able to rent that house indefinitely. They would probably need to sell that out. So it's a lawyer question. It's also a question yeah. for the town to, to think about that use case on, on how the zoning board would, would, would deal with it if, it if it made it that far. But if it's a condo, I mean, be one thing if I as a homeowner was renting, but if I've got a condo arrangement with the people who are living in the other. Oh, I see what you're saying. One of the two, um, the, and that does come really down to the how the documents are drawn. Um, the ownership the of the land has uh -huh. to be with, with one of the two owners. So you're, you're looking at it. Yeah. Uh -huh. Right. It has to be an owner occupied property. Um, and that would come into how the, the, the condo docs are written. It's a little, it's, a, it's an interesting area. Um, I, I, I kind of see it as trying to find ways to make more va land available. Um, and it, it's one of those areas where you can use law and the zoning bylaw and, and mush them together to create that marketable asset. But it raises questions like that. I think it's nice to think about having a right of first, first refusal to, you know, that if somebody is <coughs> does the other one have the first option? But I've got a child. You know, yeah, she's going to inherit. So yeah. it, 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 it's a lawyer question. Mm -hmm. a lawyer and you can with a put that in. State, right. Uh, ability. Yeah. Usually something like that would happen. So if you're going to be selling this to someone who has a, a 15, 20 year plan to stay in the house, yeah. um, there, there could be a right of first refusal put in there where they have the opportunity to buy at market and then do what they want with the home. Um, and it would be purchasing from your son or whoever, whoever is the owner. She's a girl. Girl. <laughs> <laughs> no, she's a woman. Okay. Still seems like a girl. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Okay. Um, so multi-generational living, the two things we just discussed could happen here. You could charge parents rent. You could charge a child rent. Uh, you could do condoization, but you don't really need to. Um, we're talking about home equity. Um, we're talking about that home modification loan program. Um, there's a few different pr things in there. Uh, cash. And then proceeds from, it's cash, but proceeds from the house sale of, <laughs> of a parent. Um, so talking about home equity, um, this is, if anyone's, it, it's a traditional home equity line of credit. Um, it's a cash out refinancing. Interest rates are still low. Um, so you're, you're, you're not going to be borrowing at a higher expense in all likelihood than you, you currently have. Uh, that, could be, that could be false if you have a 3.2% interest rate from back in when rates were really low. Um, but they're, they're looking at things like the loan to value ratio, so there is a max on that. Uh, when, you, when you build this new house, it's increasing the value of your house as well. So if you don't have your house fully paid off, the amount that you can borrow is going to be based on the post-construction uh, valuation of the, of the property. So the current value of the house plus, call it 150000 for the new accessory dwelling unit. And then that's where they're basing how much you can, you can access. Um, I said it briefly, home equity line of credit is a little bit different. Uh, it's more expensive to borrow with that. It could fill a gap of twenty to 50000 with the expectation of paying it back a little bit more quickly, um, whereas this is your long-term financing product to minimize the monthly payment. We talked briefly about this, home modification loan program. If you do have somebody who has a disability, mobility challenged, if they can get a doctor's note saying that they 
can't have stairs. They need some level of accessibility. Um, they need they need some level of care. This is fifty thousand dollars at zero percent interest. Um, and that's a really terrible ad symbol. Um, the way that this works as a loan is there's no repayment schedule, um, but you're expected to repay it when you sell the house or no longer live there. Um, so you could sit on this for 30 years um, and just pay back whatever 50,000 is worth 30, 30 years from now. That's a great system. It's, it's, if you are qualified for this, you have to take that money. It's, um, <laughs> it's crazy. I, it'd be crazy not to. <laughs> Are the loan-to-value ratios considerations for that loan program? Um, so the, the state of Massachusetts doesn't consider that. I don't know the answer to whether or not the bank will. Uh, the first one that's happening is going through underwriting over the next month. Um, so they'll determine if this is going gonna, is gonna to impact that. It will be different bank to bank. Um, it probably will not because this is going to be a second claim on the property. The bank will have first claim, and then the Massachusetts only gets money if the bank doesn't get all their money. So they probably it probably won't be an issue. Now, is that for the the original homeowner, or is it the parent or the relative? So this is tied to the to the house to the property that it's being lent for. Um, it's not necessarily to the person, but it's associated with a person's disability. Um, and when you fill the app out, you're explaining why you're doing it. You're attaching a doctor's note, which is specific to a person. And then it's describing work that's being done to a property. And the lien goes on that property. So essentially, everybody in the state that has a pre-existing disability who will qualify for that program is in a position to sell themselves to somebody who owns a property that you could build a standalone property on. Grab a family. bullhorn. Tell everybody. <laughs> Everyone with a disability has got 50 grand in the pocket to but build in someone's true. backyard. It's it's true. Yeah, and, and that was that guy, Chris. I, I wanted to uh, tell him to start knocking on doors. <laughs> I mean, it's it's a it's a leap. Someone's got to do it. But yeah, if they've fantastic. got a big yard, I mean, what a wonderful way to create a unit they make some rental income. The person, like everyone, is in a great position with that. Stabilize the community. That's a great idea. Oh, it's it's wonderful. I, I can't wait till it starts. I mean, I don't think so. Um, well, I don't. They can't borrow for the project they already did. Oh, okay. Uh, they could borrow for another one, though. They can borrow for, for improvement or other. <laughs> yeah, you, you um, yes. And landlords can all get this, too. A landlord can borrow this and create another, fix a unit, create a new unit. Um, there's some rules with how many units they have on to uh, whether or not they can access it. Like, if it's a commercial per person, the number is a lot smaller. Like, I don't remember off the top of my head what it was for a commercial, but I think the cap was 10 units. Where would we find out more information on this? So if you just Google Home Modification Loan Program, um, Wayfinders is the administer uh, locally. In terms of the appraised value of the home after you've done the work, let's say you have a house that currently is worth $350,000. You build a standalone unit that costs, let's say, $100,000. Is it now? looked at by the town and the real estate community as being worth the total $450,000? So there isn't, there isn't a definite answer to that because usually so an appraiser is going to be looking for comparable sales and there, will, there are no comparable sales of backyard homes. Um, that will change. It, it, it hasn't even fully changed out west yet where this has been going on at a, at a higher pace. Um, my, my guess is going to is that the appraiser is going to uh, look at it as an addition of square feet. And in Amherst, the sale price per square foot is enormous. Um, so there's probably a chance that, th there is a chance that when you build this, you have a higher value than what you put into it. Um, but 
how they look at the second kitchen is a question because houses don't have two kitchens. Um, how they look at all the extra bedrooms, it's kind of, um, it, you'll find out when the appraisal comes back if you did a home equity product. And I'll actually have some of that, the, the, the property owner, what we're doing in Florence is doing that. So I'll, I'll, I'll be getting more information on how it got viewed by an appraiser in Amherst during the process. And we'll probably have that information in the next couple months. And it will be, appraisers are supposed to use the same methodology. Um, I mean, it's different appraiser to appraiser and property to property, but, but hopefully there'll be something they do that can be applied to future situations. Cash is pretty obvious. Um, I, cat proceeds from a previous house sale, I think that's, I've seen that happen. Um, if someone's selling their house, moving into a backyard, a great place to put that cash is in a new construction in, in family's backyard. Um, I, I did just hear some of the insane down payments for getting into some of the um, elderly communities like $400,000 to, to get in, I, I think, left, yeah, it's insane. Um, and of course, once you do this, there's no monthly cost unless you're paying someone to do the lawn and whatnot. So it's a good place to put money and, and, and live for the next 20 to 30 years. Was anyone, so there were some rentals doing this as a rental? Okay. Um, so as a rental, so your options are all of the same things in the previous, but when we're talking about doing this as a rental, uh, we're backing into it from a cash flow versus ROI. And I'm going to... So return on investment, um, without going too deep into the, the, uh, how you evaluate how to do this as an investment, are your goals to get maximum cash flow or are your goals to get maximum return on investment as in like the, the yield? So if you think about bonds, you get a 4% yield, a 10% yield. You're balancing these two. And if you're maximizing cash flow, you're probably not going to be maximizing ROI. Because if you're doing ROI, you're going to be taking on a bank loan. And this is where we're going to go into the, the rabbit hole of, of, of doing leverage. Um, that bank loan is going to make the ROI go higher, but it's going to make your cash flow go lower. So that's something that, that as you're going into this as an investment, you want to decide which one. Um, maximizing cash flow is just to pay for it in cash. And then that, uh, if you're building a two bedroom detached home in your backyard, um, unfortunately the sky's the limit in Amherst for what you charge for it. Um, ideally, I mean, I think the middle of the market's somewhere around 1750. Um, these are probably going to rent as a premium rental product, especially if you're doing a 700 to 800 square foot backyard home. It's got its own space, it's got its own walls, it's got its own parking spot, uh, potentially it's got shed for a shed for storage. Um, it's basically renting a single family home. Um, when you do a tiny home, it's going to be a little bit different. I, there are there's a minimum square feet that square foot that someone's going to be willing to live in, and that will impact the rental price. Um, just, just I, I spoke to a management company today, and they said generally you think you think about the income that you're getting is five hundred dollars per bedroom, and that's for a single family home. That seems to stand with what the with what it says when you look at um, yeah. Hop Pads and Zillow and um, mm -hmm. Rent Noho and all those. But you don't so, have to do that, right? You don't have to. You, do. don't you have can to, rent but it that's for. That's generally the the going rate, I think. In yeah. Is that five hundred in profit or five hundred no, 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 no. that you charge per bedroom? So I'll tell you have a four bedroom house. Or it's definitely. So I saw I saw some seven. rentals. I saw some five bedrooms rented uh, listed for thirty six hundred okay. when I was looking yesterday. And this well, that's uh, more buildings, buildings, these apartment buildings, the apartment the bedrooms are like six or seven hundred dollars. Yeah, so it if you're where you are too, compared to the, where you are to campus. 
Yeah, generally, so the first bedroom in an apartment is a higher rental rate than the second bedroom and the third bedroom and the fourth bedroom. Uh, the market in Amherst makes that a little bit different because you have students willing to live all together and a student is willing to pay what they would for a, a one bedroom apartment to live in a single family house. Mm -hmm. So if they're willing to spend $700 on a one bedroom apartment, they're probably willing to pay $700 to live in a bedroom in someone's house with roommates. Okay. And that's what happens in, it, it, it happens, I saw, it, it happened where I have some multifamilies back in Maine in a college town. I've seen it in the rent prices everywhere where there's college. How much does it cost to build one of these separate units? Good question. Um, so it's all over the place. Obviously, we build them. We can do uh, our, our mid-level one bedrooms, 142,000, ready to move in. Um, doesn't include replacing the septic. Um, we can do a two-bedroom for 155. I've heard average costs in around here can be as much as 350 to 450 dollars a square foot. I mean, it's all over the place. Um, I don't know where we where our costs are staying in the pack. Um, but it ultimately comes down to what you want to build. I mean, if you're building a rental unit, you're going to want to optimize where you're spending dollars to maximize um, durability and how nice it is. So like in a rental unit, you're not going to put money into super high-end handmade cabinets with a Brazilian cherry finish, but you're probably going to buy a high-end Marillac cabinet that can take some abuse and looks really good. And you'll probably put quartz countertops in it so the laminate doesn't come apart. Um, if you're building on your own, you figure out what do you want. Do you want to spend money on a really nice fireplace? Um, do you want to have really nice hardwood flooring? Do you want all kinds of different gabled roofs, cathedral ceilings, and God, you can spend as little or as much as you want to do it. So the 142,000, what's the square footage? That one's 575. That was, um, I don't want to do too much on. I can, if you guys want more info, I can send this. That one specifically is that one. Okay. How many bedrooms does that one have? That's one. Yeah, I can't really put too many. Uh, sure. You can't put too many more than one in. It really needs 700 so square that's, feet. That's turnkey. Turnkey. Yep. Yeah. So if it needs a septic, it has a septic. If it needs a hookup, that's done. It has gas, it has water, it has um, so we don't, we don't, I wouldn't recommend doing these with gas. Um, with small square feet, it's very easy to get to net zero. Uh, you don't, I mean, you can put enough solar on the roof of that to make it net zero um, without doing double stud walls and triple pane windows. So you're at the, when you're in small and you're using efficient space, you can just do a mini split. And if you're really worried about whether or not it's going to work in January, you can add an electric space heater. Um, and, and that generally does it. And if you avoid doing gas, you're, you're eliminating a whole other specialty. You're eliminating another trench. Um, and, I, it, and I believe you can't do it at all because of the moratorium. Right. So, yeah. But yeah, propane. And then you have to add a tank, and you have to have someone fill it. And propane delivery is incredibly expensive. Um, so. I wouldn't recommend gas. So do you put the solar on when you pour it? We don't. We would, coord we would coordinate it. We kind of, we, um, we, we, we coordinate everything. And we have different partners who bring stuff in, so solar and plumbing and building and all that good stuff. The first step in all this before construction, though, kind of in the execution, is it's, it's, a, it's a, at least a month to figure out what you're going to build and plan out your financial financing strategy. And you're doing that in what are your goals for the property? Where do you want it to be in 30 years? And then backing into what you can afford. What is the cost of maintenance on these things? What's the cost of maintenance on the whole house? So you kind of get through that whole thing before you even think about your construction methodology. Because nowadays, You've got traditional stick building, stick built construction where they build everything for six months in your backyard, um, and you can get anything you want basically. You got modular construction, which is building a huge portion of the home and components in a factory environment where it's uh, quality control, and you can do a lot of customizations of that. And then you've got panelization, 
which you're building full walls and you're you're clipping you're building walls with high-end machinery um, basically it, it's how they do it pretty much all, all over Scandinavia Sweden pretty much built exclusively modular and panelized um, but you're basically coming up with the plans for the house that you want and bringing them in in pieces so you don't have people doing all of that work and getting weather delays and all of that and I'm tuning that one because we are panelized and modular because when I started this I could I didn't know how to build a construction team with a labor shortage um, you've got to if, if you find good people you got to have them doing the high-end stuff that you see at the end of the day you can't have them putting studs together in, in your backyard so we just focus we have them focus on building nice pergolas or nice stonework outside or putting fox beams inside hardwood floors stuff like that so there's no architect being involved in um, so if we're if it gets to the point where we think we need one we'll bring one in um, but we don't generally I mean if it depends on the complexity uh, generally for floor plan design you can go back and forth uh, with a home designer and the homeowner and do virtual tours and get a very good feel for it and once you've brought it to that point you can kind of make that decision should we pay five hundred to fifteen hundred dollars for an architectural consult um, if, we're, if you're doing full passive construction, you'd probably bring one earlier because you're going to want to bring in more than, you're not going to just say, okay, southern sun exposure is over there. Let's make sure we have more windows on that side. Let's get a slight overhang on the roof. You're going to, there's, there's a lot more involved. So it just depends on the complexity. If you're doing a big development, um, probably going to need some kind of architectural civil engineering review of the site plans because um, it's going to take into all kinds of stuff that's over my head. Um, but it's just figuring out when to do that um, so you're not paying for it if you don't need it. Did, did you, I came in late. Did you talk at the beginning about, like, I sort of have this image in my head of a tiny house. Did you talk about that at the beginning? Um, yeah, I can. I can. What, what, you know, like, it looks like a trailer, but it's on wheels and it's made of wood, not the, yeah, yeah. like that. Um, Where do those fit into what you've been talking about? Uh, so, touch on a, so the difference is this generally is built to recreational vehicle code, and this is built to building code. So there's a difference in how much insula insulation is in this, and how it's tied to septic and water. Um, but can they still get approved the way you were talking about all the We can we can approve this if it's like this on a foundation attached to a approved sewer, sewer and water and meets all of the building code on the construction. So you just, you just can't have it on it's wheels and on yeah, yeah, you have to have a sewer plan and it has to be the building code. And it can hook up to all of those utilities from the regular house if it's within a certain distance of the house? Yes, yep. That's exactly how you do it. A little bit. <laughs> I, someone said she has to replace her yurt in Shootsbury so she can become legal. <laughs> that was a phone call I had about a month ago. Um, they, they, they don't meet building code. They, they're generally canvas. They're not going to be energy efficient enough. Um, you still have to connect them to utilities. So it's kind of the, it's kind of the same thing as a tiny home. It, it's a dwelling, but it can't be a permanent dwelling. Is there? Yeah, the the other thing. Yeah, the, the the other thing that's happening with yurts is the um, so a yurt by definition is a Mongolian living structure gets taken down and put back up and made of animal skin. A yurt today is like fancy camping, and it may have wood walls. It's generally circular. So when someone says yurt, you don't know what they, they may be meaning the Mongolian variety of yurt <laughs> with a fire in the middle. <laughs> they may be, they might be meaning California glamping. I mean, it's kind of the same with tiny home. People say that's a tiny home, but we say that's a tiny home. There's, there's, no, there's no formal definitions around any of it. I, I thought 
the tiny home had to be on a 400 square feet or less. So for building code, that was defined. Yes, yeah, so to be a tiny home and to have the uh, amendments to building code, it does have to be less than 400. So that is official. But it can't be less than 350 here. But it can't be less than 350, right. In general, the definition of a tiny home is 400 square feet or less. Mm -hmm. 